Good morning, Natasha Files, Minister for Health. Is everyone ready to go? Got Paula, who is interpreting for us in Ausland, and Dr. Jackie Murdoch, one of our acting deputy chief health officers. Uh, for Territorians, an update on the COVID-19 situation. We had 828 new cases in the 24 hours to 8 p.m. yesterday evening, uh, and that was made up of 648 rapid antigen tests. Um, and uh, I don't have the specific number of PCR tests there, but the remainder were PCR. Um, we also have information that yesterday's case numbers were revised up uh, from 940 to 1006, and that was uh, additional um, positive cases uploaded uh, individuals through their rat tests. So um, we're starting to, to provide that information on a daily basis uh, so that people can uh, understand the cases in the last few days. And again, just remind people, if you do get that positive rat test, um, we hope that you are well and you've got everything you need. Uh, but if you could upload that test as quickly as possible, it just helps us ascertain our numbers uh, the quicker uh, and more accurate. Uh, NT-wide, we've got 4,650 active cases in the Territory. Um, a significant number of the cases are in the top end. More than half the cases today that were reported are in the top end, uh, and a quarter of the cases are in Central Australia. Um, I'll talk to the hospital um, uh, figures. I'll also talk to some changes in public health advice. Uh, and um, I'll just highlight a, a couple of specific community examples. I'm not going to go through community by community the case numbers. They will be on the secure NT statement that goes out, and I'm of course happy to answer any specific questions on them. Uh, so in terms of hospital numbers, 111 uh, people are in Northern Territory hospitals with COVID-19. We have 10 people on oxygen, and five people are in intensive care receiving treatment. The breakdown is 34 people in Alice Springs Hospital, uh, three on oxygen and two in intensive care. There's three people in Catherine and three people in Tennant Creek Hospitals. We've got four people in the Gove Hospital receiving care, and there's 67 people in the Royal Darwin Hospital, including seven on oxygen and three in intensive care. So we, of course, thank our staff that are caring for them uh, and also wish them uh, a speedy recovery from COVID. We're seeing case numbers, as I said, right across the Northern Territory. COVID is in every region. Uh, we're seeing a large number of people that are asymptomatic, uh, they're, they're feeling uh, mildly unwell and they're able to, to be cared for at home. Uh, in terms of, um, we predicted as, as people came back from the, the Christmas January holidays, we expected case numbers to, to rise at this point that we would have incursions. Uh, and so the health advice uh, for public health measures um, is that we will put in place a Northern Territory uh, wide mask mandate for outdoors. So this will be for seven days. Uh, just while we're seeing uh, these increasing case numbers, we know that masks are a really vital tool in stopping the spread of COVID, particularly with Omicron, and, and Dr Murdoch can speak to that. So it'll be um, uh, similar to what we've had before. It'll be outside if you can't physically distance. It'll be for people aged 12 and over. Uh, and if you are exercising, you don't need to wear that mask. So uh, we're seeing many Territorians, uh, as I'm out and about in the community, they are wearing uh, masks even outdoors. So they're a really great tool in, in stopping that spread. Uh, and so uh, that mask mandate will come in for seven days uh, at this stage, and then it's anticipated would revert back to the indoor mask mandate. So this is just acknowledging, uh, as we predicted, an increase in case numbers uh, with the conclusion of the, the school holidays and, and people returning to the Territory. The other public health measure changes today is that Warramiyunga, Ski Beach and Utopia were all due to finish their lockdowns uh, at 2pm, uh, and that will happen. Uh, they will uh, revert back uh, to the other public health measures that are in place. There's a number of communities that uh, their public health uh, lockdowns and lockouts uh, are due to finish tomorrow. We did discuss that today, but we'll just consider some more advice from our health officials uh, and a decision uh, will be made tomorrow. So for the residents of Warramiyunga, Ski Beach and Utopia, um, their respective lockdowns and lockouts will lift and the other communities will uh, consider tomorrow. So the territory-wide mask mandate will come into place from 6 p.m. this evening. Uh, so just allow a few people to, to make sure that they do have their masks if they're outdoors. Uh, many people have become very accustomed to it and uh, are wearing them. So if you can physically distance or you're exercising, you don't need to wear that mask. But this is just uh, considering we've seen a large increase in those new cases, which we largely attribute to the end of 
um, the school holidays and that higher interstate arrivals. Um, and so we really want to get our case numbers back down to that um, you know, average that we we're seeing around 450, uh, seven day average. I just, um, before I hand to Dr Murdoch, just want to speak to a couple of communities. Alice Springs Prison has had 154 new cases and so we uh, sent a testing team into the prison uh, and uh, they tested uh, everyone at the facility. But we've seen 154 new cases in this reporting period, which has brought that cluster to 274. Um, my understanding is from this 154 people, all are asymptomatic. So if we hadn't have tested them, they probably wouldn't have known that they had COVID so they're all feeling well. The vaccination rate for the prison is at 86%. Uh, so that is just a, a, a significant increase and so certainly worth sharing with the community. Uh, we're also working with the community of Millingimby. Um, we've got 22 new cases at Millingimby and so um, it is an Aboriginal medical organisation, MeWatch, who run the clinic there. So um, our officials are just working through what uh, assistance they will need uh, in this situation so that we can provide them with the support and resources. And we'll also be um, working with the community of Wadai. We've seen, we saw, I think, yesterday uh, the first case out there. So um, we will um, work around what assistance is needed for, for the Wadai region. So just a message for Territorians in remote communities. Um, and I spoke about this a couple of weeks ago. And it's really important communities update their COVID management plans to reflect Omicron and to reflect the situation that COVID is in every community in the Territory. We certainly want to stop the spread and flatten that curve, which we, we had achieved earlier in the week. But you won't see the types of, of lockdowns and responses that perhaps you have seen previously. Um, the health advice because we do have COVID here in the Territory has changed. But we, of course, consider every community um, on its um, situation, its vaccination rate, etc. Um, and just uh, away from COVID, but um, the food supply uh, into the Territory has certainly been impacted. Uh, I just have some advice for residents in um, remote communities where advised that they've got large supplies of um, frozen goods and, and dry goods, um, very much used to the wet season. And so uh, in terms of supplies for the, the outback stores, uh, that, that should be consistent. Um, IGA also supply a number of the community stores and they advise us they've got many weeks of stock. But we certainly have seen a big impact in uh, Darwin. I know I was at a local supermarket this morning and uh, there was many empty shelves. Um, Supplies are limited, but the advice we have is that uh, we've rerouted um, or the uh, uh, supermarkets have rerouted those trucks uh, through Queensland. So we should start to see supplies come through uh, in the next few days. Additionally, I've just been advised that a couple of um, goods trucks have been able to get through the South Australian Stewart Highway entry into the Territory. So uh, hopefully it's just uh, short lived, but people uh, certainly would be noting uh, an impact to what's available uh, and uh, some varied menus on the households of uh, Territorians. So I'll hand to Dr Murdoch to provide some comments and we're both happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I just want to echo what the Minister said, that we do have um, and some higher case numbers again today, and to reassure people that for the vast majority of people with Omicron, uh, it is a mild illness. So especially for vaccinated people um, <clears throat> and those who have had their booster, we know that um, it will be a mild illness, it will be um, self-limiting, you need to stay home and um, look after yourself. Um, but the vast majority of people are able to be at home. What we want to do is be able to concentrate on people who are unwell and um, identify those people who might may be at risk of getting unwell. And um, that can in include um, triaging people, um, identifying particularly vulnerable people, making sure that they've been tested um, and that they have access to the care that they need, be that the preventative um, care to stop people deteriorating, like the um, IV monoclonal antibodies, or um, more supportive care in hospital. Um, so, th so that's really where our focus is right now. Um, having said that, we also want to see these numbers coming down. So we have seen that increase over the last few days, um, which you know, we do think is related to people returning um, back to the Northern Territory in the lead up to school going back. Um, 
and we need effective public health measures for that. And what we have seen and what we know from the international evidence is that masks are really effective at stopping um, the spread of Omicron. Um, and so that's why we've recommended the introduction of an outdoor mask mandate to try and stop those increased numbers translating into more um, community transmission. So it's really important to make sure you're wearing your mask while inside and now also while outside as well, particularly where you can't socially distance um, to make sure that we don't um, see an increase in, in case numbers. Um, as the Minister said, um, happy to answer questions. Thank you. Did you want to Dr. Meadow for myself first? Yeah, of course. Um, just with, with regard to the change in everyday things of the NT government coming out and adding 100 tests to the day before the results, um, and primarily being rap tests. But if someone hypothetically gets a, a PCR test on a Wednesday and the result is returned on a Friday, it goes as Friday somehow. Why are we doing something completely different for rap tests? Do you want to speak to the... And, uh, and seemingly, you know, making numbers more, I guess, confusing for the average person. Yeah, so what we, uh, you saw initially that even if someone had returned a positive rat, they had to go and get a PCR test. Uh, we then have seen uh, in terms of the accuracy of the rat test that greatly increased throughout the pandemic. And so our health officials advised that we could um, verify a case of COVID off a rapid antigen test. So you saw that change. Uh, and so in terms of a PCR test, those tests are resulted to 8 p.m. So as soon as um, the laboratory test is resulted, um, that accounts for that day's figure. So you are correct, someone has a test on a Wednesday, it's resulted 7.30 on a Friday evening, it counts in Friday statistics. With the rapid antigen test, an individual can take that test at home uh, and we then, at the point that it turned positive, is when uh, it should be counted. And so uh, that's why we're asking people if they can please, uh, on the day they take the test, upload those results before 8 p.m. Uh, it does help alleviate the point that you've just made. So why the Northern Territory are asked to you know, submit their test within two days, their rapid antigen test yes. within two days. Has that changed? Yeah, so we spoke about that earlier in the week and I asked uh, if the information could please be changed uh, so that uh, people realise the importance of uploading that test as soon as possible. Uh, of course, uh, we've got people working around the clock extremely hard across the Territory, uh, but we just need to take some time to update that material. With yes, Miles. Oh, sorry, Miles. I'll just answer, Miles had a question on this and then I'll go to you, Jack, sorry. Yeah, sure, and yep. so, uh, just on this idea of, uh, I'm still not really clear of why PCR tests is okay to be counted on Friday when, it, when we get the result on Friday versus a Wednesday. And rat test, why isn't it able to be counted on the day that we it's actually uploaded and tagged as positive? So in terms of the um, collation of the data and the recording of it, it's when the positive test is received. So with a rapid antigen test, it's done within 15, 20 minutes, you have that result. Uh, and it might be that you know it's many days later, you upload it to our system, but the result was recorded on that date. With a PCR test, it comes out of the machines at the laboratory and it's recorded. And this, um, back when we were doing that detailed contact tracing when we were, were really looking at um, the, the numbers in the Territory, um, you would see that we would uh, allocate a case, but we couldn't tell you who it was or where it was initially, but we would allocate it to that day. So um, there is ethics behind all of this with, in terms of laboratories, and uh, it's just recognising that we would like to know the results uh, as, as quickly as possible, so we ask people to please upload those rat tests before 8pm on the day that it was taken. Jack, you had a question. Um, could yeah. we get some more information on the mask uh, mandate at uh, all? Will this include exercise? Are you able to take it off for exercise? Just some more information on the mask mandate for territorians? Yes, so um, we've had territorians really um, abide by the indoor mask mandate. They've been fantastic. And you've actually started to people to see people take personal responsibility wearing masks. Um, I was out at the football last night and people had masks on when they couldn't physically distance and they were moving around the grounds. Uh, and so it, it's an extension of that. We know that they're a really great tool in stopping the spread uh, of, of the virus. And so people um, should wear a mask when they're outdoors and they can't physically distance. Uh, if you are exercising, it is okay to take your, your mask off. Uh, we certainly um, you know, want to make sure we're proportionate in the response. And it's intended to be in place for seven days from 6 p.m. this evening, uh, this mask mandate. So then it is envisaged we'll revert back to the um, indoor only mask mandate. The indoor mask mandate is with us for some time. We, we said that when it was initially uh, put in place. 
place uh, because of the, the heightened risk in an indoor environment. But this mask mandate, uh, just around the increasing numbers we've seen, which we were expecting as, as school returned and interstate travellers would arrive back. I hope that answers your question, Jack. You said that 50 per cent of the new cases reported were from the top end. 70 per cent of the territory population lives in Darwin. So I'm seeing a proportionately high number of cases in remote communities. And does this seem to suggest that the surge in cases isn't actually coming from return interstate travellers, but actually community transmission? No, so we're seeing the majority of the cases in the top end where the population is. Um, this is something that we did discuss with our health officials. Uh, you know, how can we be sure that these cases are returning into state travellers? But we've seen um, the incoming arrivals into the Territory have been higher uh, over the, the last few days. And so we would expect, um, you know, coming into to Monday, Tuesday next week, that the interstate arrivals would drop off. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll see that flattening of the curve again with our COVID cases. So what portion of the 800 or so cases we reported today are interstate arrivals back into the territory versus community transmission? Um, I don't have that breakdown. I'd be happy to seek advice around what information we can provide to answer that question. A yes, lot of epidemiologists, and this may be one for the acting deputy, Joe, have spoken about the um, scale of effectiveness from an N95 to a surgical to a cloth mask. Is there any discussion amongst government at the moment around moving away from cloth masks and mandating specific types of masks? Um, I will hand to the, the Deputy Chair to answer that question. Um, thanks. I mean, certainly the, not all masks are equal. Um, and uh, sorry, I'll take mine off. Um, N95s, you know, are very effective. Um, surgical masks are next, next effective and um, cloth masks a bit further down the list and there are different kinds of cloth masks. Um, at this stage, you know, there, a barrier still has a lot of effectiveness. Masks are not a perfect measure on a population-wide scale, um, but if you wear them correctly, so over your nose and over your mouth, um, and the other person who, who um, may be COVID positive unknowingly is also wearing them correctly, they provide a good deal of protection. What was the health basis from moving Utopia out of lockdown and on Blood Watch, which is quite a close community, relatively speaking, and has travelled in between Utopia and Blood Watch, uh, keeping them in lockdown? So what we've seen in Utopia over the last few days is, is a low number of cases. Um, in and Blood Watch, we've seen um, an a number of cases just starting up, just starting to reach the community. Um, and we know that Amblada Watch has a, a lower vaccination rate. Um, so what we want to be able to do is focus our resources there um, to be able to identify and isolate people um, effectively in Amblada Watch early to try and prevent that from, from spreading um, any further. With regards to the outdoor mask mandate, sort of, I'm not expert, but it was my understanding from sort of scientists that the risk of transmission of COVID outdoors was relatively low. What has prompted a change here in regards to mandating masks outdoors? So the risk is certainly lower of catching COVID outside, and that's why we also say, you know, if you can catch up outside, obviously the weather um, at the moment is not making that easy in certain parts of the territory. Um, uh, but you can still catch COVID outside. It's, it's certainly not, um, doesn't have an indoors only policy. So um, with our increasing um, case numbers, that means there's more out there in the community. We want to try and reduce that transmission as much as possible. Just for the health minister. Yeah. Now, um, with regards to this decision to go with the mandate, why are you considering these measures and other measures also on the table to try and bring down the level of transmission? Yeah, so we've uh, obviously been uh, re meeting regularly, getting all the information from our health officials. Uh, and what we've said today is that those um, three communities can lift, but we're looking closely at the other communities and a decision will be made in the morning. Uh, just bringing it back, for example, Utopia had one case, um, Bottle Watch had eight cases today, the vaccination rate. So all of that is taken into consideration. Uh, we believe that we have been, and we've been saying this for some days now, proportionate in our response. 
students. Uh, we have flattened that curve, but as we expected, uh, heading back into the school year, we saw uh, we've seen an increase in cases, uh, and we believe that the mask mandate um, is an appropriate uh, public health measure based on the advice from our officials. Uh, we certainly haven't ruled out further measures uh, or further changes going forward. I'm glad the watch is a place that has no telco, no airstrip, and uh, is obviously limited road access. What is the government's plan, particularly as people in that community say they're feeling abandoned? to support them? What will the support actually look like? Yeah, so this is a question that we're receiving uh, with cases right across the Territory. And as we've just heard, uh, the large majority of people um, will have a mild illness. So we really need to make sure that we focus the care on the people that need it and that we also uh, can start to see that early on so that we can get those medical interventions to them. So we've got a very strong structure in the Northern Territory uh, around COVID and it's based on our emergency services. So we have those local um, community organisations and groups feeding into uh, incident management teams, for example, in this situation in Southern Command, uh, ensuring that we have all that information coming through to the Territory Controller. Uh, and I can assure you that, uh, just to give Territorians an understanding, when we meet and we talk through these issues uh, and questions arise, there is certainly a back and forth with information from the regions. It's not that the decisions are just made on an assumption. Do you have any figures about whether any inmates from the Alice Springs Correctional Centre have been taken to hospital? I uh, haven't been advised that any uh, have been taken to hospital. I'll clarify that and make sure if there is a difference to that, that we provide that offline. 67 beds have been redeployed from the top to the CNR. That's dramatically reduced its capacity against calls from Archos. Uh, is this a phasing out of the top? No, so we've had this question this morning, uh, and so what we have seen is that um, we've got teams from the Centre for National Resilience did head down to the Todd facility to provide additional support, uh, and so we will see those people return uh, back up to the top end. They, they were seconded down there to provide support. Uh, in terms of the, the Todd facility, um, we of course have people exiting the facility, but I've sought advice and I, I cannot confirm that 67 people ha have been exited out. Now, uh, Dr. Josie Douglas, Dr. Josie Douglas yesterday was saying that Central Australia has been left behind by the government as resources and attention has been focused on the top end. What, what do you say to that? I completely disagree with those comments. We have worked hard right across the Northern Territory, not only with the Aboriginal medical organisations, but with other community organisations, with the land councils, uh, with the shires. Uh, and as I just explained the structure, we've got structures uh, in the region so that there is direct information from community, community uh, providing that, uh, and all of that is taken into account. We've got health teams that are based in Central Australia making decisions for Central Aliens, uh, and so I certainly uh, would disagree with those comments. Um, it's been a fairly tumultuous 24 hours for the CLP. Um, they've lost their only federal parliamentarian. What's your reaction to that? Oh, it's back to the old days of the chaotic, dysfunctional CLP. They're in crisis. Where is their leader, Leah Finocchiaro? Uh, their, their senator leaving the CLP is huge. Uh, and so it certainly reminds Territorians of what we went through under their leadership between 2012 and 2016. It shows that they haven't changed. Thank you. Fantastic.